Hello everyone, happy St. Patrick's Day and welcome to our McGuire Woods webinar, Who's at Bat and What's on Deck, Federal Employment and Affirmative Action under the Biden Administration. My name is Brian Barger and I'm a Labor and Employment and Affirmative Action Partner here in our firm Charlotte, North Carolina office. Joining me from Raleigh is my fellow partner, Bill Doyle, also from our Labor and Employment and Affirmative Action team. Uh, in addition, joining from our McGuire Woods consulting arm in D.C. is Edward Hill, who serves as our VP for Federal Public Affairs. For individuals tuning in today who may not know a lot about our firm, separate from Bill and myself, we have an army of lawyers here at McGuire Woods with over 1,000 attorneys and 26 offices with industry and substantive expertise across uh, the business spectrum. We're also fortunate to have a subsidiary, McGuire Woods Consulting, with individuals like Edward who provide public affairs, lobbying, communications, and other services to clients hand-in-hand -hand with the work that we do here on the legal side of the house. If you'd like to learn more, or if we give you any help to you in any way, just let us know uh, after this web webinar by email or otherwise. We're happy to lend a hand. Uh, before we dive into the topics today, let me mention a few items about the platform itself. On your screen, you should see several icons. First, the resources icon includes a copy of the presentation itself. If you'd like, you're welcome to save the deck to your desktop or to print it to follow along during the presentation. Second, you'll also see a Q&A feature. You can use this to submit any questions that you have throughout the webinar. We'll be leaving all questions to the end of the program and, do, and we'll do our best to get to what we can uh, if time allows. However, if we're unable to get to your question, just know that we'll follow up with you individually after the program is over, so far away. All questions are great. Please also note that this presentation is being recorded. We'll circulate a link to the recording together with the webinar deck over the next few days after the presentation is over. So feel free to use that for yourself or feel free to share it with others in your organization. So that's it for the instructions and now on to our topics. Uh, specifically, as some of you may recall, back in December, Edward, Bill, and I conducted a post-election webinar where we attempted to forecast coming labor and employment attractions for the year ahead. Now, here we stand here in March, almost two months into the Biden administration, and we definitely have a much better feel for the regulatory and enforcement game plan that lies ahead of us. Uh, we also definitely have a good bit more information about who actually is going to make up the new Biden labor and employment team. So today we're actually going to be discussing federal policy and regulatory landscape uh, from a DOL, EEOC, OSHA, and other perspective looking ahead. We'll look at their key appointees that have already been made, uh, those that are in pocket and those that are awaiting uh, Senate approval. Uh, and we're also going to talk and end our discussion uh, chatting a little bit about legislative and enforcement items on deck for 2021 and beyond. So with that, to start us off, I'm going to turn things over to Edward. Mr. Hill? Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, Brian, for the introduction and for uh, discussing some of our topics today. Uh, I'll start by talking a little bit about the administration, the political landscape, and some uh, appointments, uh, confirmations we can expect uh, soon. And so, you know, first and foremost, um, we, as, as Brian mentioned, we are in the first two months of a Biden presidency, and we're still heavy in the confirmation process uh, with some of the agencies. We've seen the Department of Housing, Department of Transportation, Veterans Affairs, um, their secretaries to be confirmed uh, via the Senate. And so now um, <clears throat> I think an important person for the Department of Labor will be the secretary, uh, as we know, Marty Walsh, who is the former, uh, former mayor of Boston, uh, has been uh, appointed to the role. We're right now waiting for his confirmation. Uh, I understand that his confirmation will probably take place next week at, uh, at some time. And so right now, I'm actually going to kind of cut this, move move past presidential uh, and House races and talk a little bit more about the confirmation process and the Senate and some of the uh, likely uh, legislation that may or may not come through uh, Congress. And so I think it's important to note the uh, budget reconciliation process 
and how that will impact federal legislation. Uh, right now, uh, 50 Democrats uh, really need to vote in support of a number of measures. As we've seen with the coronavirus, um, uh, the coronavirus and this last bill that uh, passed through Congress related to relief, uh, we, we've seen sort of the back and forth there. But I think things move relatively smoothly. <clears throat> but I think the challenge on some of the more controversial issues will be whether or not the Democratic Party can gain 50 votes. And we saw with the the last relief bill that you had a few uh, Democrats that did not vote in favor of certain things. And that, and one big thing was the minimum wage. Um, we would, uh, you know, it's been proposed for a um, fifteen dollar minimum wage. Some uh, some Republicans and some Democrats were in favor of it, but uh, other Democrats were not. Um, John, uh, Senator Manchin being one, uh, we had the two senators from uh, Delaware, which is kind of interesting because you know they represent um, Joe Biden's former home state, right? So it's interesting dynamic to have them you know, to hourly oppose uh, the min- something like the minimum wage, <clears throat> but uh, it goes to show you there that you know we have to question really what 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 the president's intention is on this as well. So that's an issue that I think. We'll be following. It's an important piece to the Department of Labor's overall um, uh, priorities and objectives. And so we'll keep our eyes open there. Uh, Just to kind of give a little bit of background beyond the reconciliation process, I just want to talk a little bit about the committees of jurisdiction. Uh, A couple months ago, we really didn't – well, I think we knew who would be – uh, at the helm of the gavel on the House side and potentially the Senate with uh, Patty Murray. But, um, you know, Bernie Sanders is going to be chair of the Senate uh, Budget Committee. Uh, John Yarmuth, who's, he's been he's been the chair for uh, uh, quite some time, but I think it's important to know Bernie Sanders and, um, you know, who represents the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. And so we will uh, we'll see a lot. Of what uh, of what Bernie has to offer in the next year's chair, but you know I I can likely um, you know propose there'll be some 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 things that he and the president are not aligned on, and, and even um, the party. <laughs> and so uh, here, Brian and Bill put together a <laughs> a little slide here. It's, it's kind of funny, but. Um, as, as mentioned about Bernie, I mean, he represents the, the progressive uh, arm of the wing. And so uh, we will see what comes out of this term and, and what comes out of the discussions he has with the Senate and, and President Biden. So I think a, a big piece, and I, I kind of touched on this, would be the um, the impact and the speed at which uh, appointments and measures uh, will get through the Senate. We uh, and I think our, the next slide kind of talks about the executive order comparison. Um, you know, we acknowledged this a little earlier that we are in the first two months of the presidency, and you know, well, actually, yeah, within the first. So, you know, in identifying the executive order comparison, the first thirty days, you know, you can clearly see that. President Biden has made far more executive orders than than President Trump, but a lot of it is um, sort of overturning what um, what pre- what uh, former President Trump um, had issued executive orders, and so we're going to see a lot of that uh, over the next month or a few months. And so I just thought this was important to note. So again, here other political takeaways uh, from the American Rescue Plan, uh, and we're, we're going to have this uh, this slide deck available to you all, so you'll be able to see um, the summary here and some of the things that were included in the legislation. But I think it's important to note some of the Democrats who we want to keep our eyes on, who uh, may have uh, views that are contrary to the Democratic Party, or or even you know. Uh, our group that represent the progressive arm of the party. 
um, Senator Sinema and Senator Manchin are, are, are definitely two. They were two of eight Democrats who uh, voted against the $15 federal minimum wage. So uh, Chris Coons, uh, Tom Carper were two, uh, John Tester. Uh, so, so these are all names and uh, folks that we should keep our eyes on when it comes to legislation that, um, you know, might be controversial. So as far as um, EEOC, I'm going to pass this back over to Brian and Bill, um, and I'll talk a little bit about it as well. Thanks, Edward. Um, and Edward, on the on the political, you know, legislative front, it does seem that um, the legislative proposals and the initiatives that have been uh, center stage so far, and including the American Rescue um, Plan, I mean that that is the largest federal uh, spending, uh, even as a proportion of uh, GDP um, compared to um, uh, World War II um, spending levels, and there's discussion now that's being teed up on a very, you know, a, a infrastructure package that might be four trillion dollars, and, and perhaps a tax package that could uh, be quite significant. Um, uh, and, and so it seems like on a lot of the labor and employment policy issues would be fairly low. Uh, on the scale compared to those types of uh, items, which take up a lot of uh, legislative energy, given the scale of the uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, in turning to some of the uh, key personnel that we've seen uh, put in place by the Biden administration here in the last uh, two months. Uh, and starting with the, the EOC, which is uh, an agency that uh, occupies a pretty central place for those of us like me who do a lot of class systemic discrimination uh, work, which includes litigation with the EOC um, or, you know, activities that might be uh, influenced by EOC guidance. Um, we still have a Republican majority um, we, what we've seen is that the top two bullets are um, now. Th this is from our earlier slide in uh, back in um, in uh, December. The Dylan is no longer the chair now. Uh, Charlotte Burroughs, who's pictured there, is the, is the chair, and uh, Sunderling is no longer the vice chair. Uh, Jocelyn Samuels is the uh, is the vice chair. So they have kind of. Um, some degree of uh, administrative control over the agency, but the Republican majority put in place some uh, items at, at the end of the Trump administration that, uh, su such as a requirement that uh, any litigation be approved by a majority of the commissioners, that um, that, that that type of thing um, will somewhat limit what EOC uh, can do, at least for a couple of years, and you have the dates there of when their uh, terms will expire, and you can see when um, uh, President Biden would have an opportunity to nominate uh, replacements uh, who uh, could shift to a uh, to a uh, Democrat majority. And often these replacement actions are done like on a um, on a bipartisan three to two uh, type approach. Um, but we'll see how that. Uh, how that plays out. The NLRB is in a, in a similar um, situation, at least for six or eight months here, where there's a Republican um, majority. The chair, just like we said with the last slide, this is Ring was the, uh, John Ring was the chair, um, and now that's um, that shifted to uh, Lauren McFerrin. Uh, by, when President Biden came in, he immediately made that uh, shift. So there's uh, some degree of uh, operational um, control, but the Republicans control kind of the ultimate decision authority uh, in terms of board uh, decisions and um, and ultimate uh, you know policy making through uh, formal adjudication. Um, so we'll see how that plays out, but that could shift quick, more quickly than the EOC because 
uh, Emmanuel's term is up uh, this summer, uh, and there's already a, a vacancy, uh, so there could be uh, some action there. And as we recall, there's no uh, longer any uh, legislative filibuster in the Senate on uh, confirmations. So the and here's um, Marty Walsh is the Secretary of Labor nominee who will be confirmed as Edward said probably next week. Um, it's interesting he has a lot of he comes from a union background and uh, he was he you know has significant experience serving as the mayor of a major uh, you know American. Uh, city and um, so he, he's in a pretty good position. But one of the things that's very interesting about um, Marty uh, on something that really is central to DOL and uh, OFCCP on pay equity, he's got a ton of experience on pay equity, which is a little bit surprising. But he he worked since um, 2013 on a private public uh, initiative. Um, that was under the auspices of uh, the Boston Women's Workforce uh, Council, and they uh, came up with this uh, kind of a voluntary program called 100% Talent Compact, and they issued periodic reports. Uh, there's a 2020 report that you can get online that's maybe 40 pages long, and it details all kinds of uh, outputs from their study uh, where they engage voluntarily with the business community, and there's vi business community represent representation within this. So instead of a mandate, top-down approach, he came up with an approach that was really more of a partnership with the business community. And that's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out, because it's very unique to have a uh, Secretary of Labor, who, who at the very top really has a good understanding of pay equity issues and a very deep understanding of the practical approaches that one might consider in engaging the business community uh, versus somebody who might take more of kind of an enforcement-oriented uh, uh, approach in uh, other uh, jurisdictions or other um, views on how to uh, address pay equity. Julie Hsu has been nominated as the Deputy Secretary of Labor, just tons of experience in the labor and employment uh, space coming from uh, California, um, you know, is a, is a lawyer, has a, a significant um, experience in uh, uh, litigation issues, um, but also long time experience um, on labor policy matters for California. And obviously, the, the view is that she's probably going to bring more of a um, uh, progressive uh, perspective on labor and employment um, uh, issues, including issues on uh, equal employment opportunity that affect OCCP uh, in uh, in the next coming uh, four years. Um, Jenny Yang, we talked about on our, we, I think we predicted relatively accurately with one other uh, option would be uh, uh, the director of uh, OFCCP, very uh, fast paced that uh, the Biden administration has been moving on. Uh, she was in place on day one, which is definitely breaking all uh, earlier records by probably five or six months. Um, and so she got tons of uh, EEO um, experience, um, but uh, it, it, this is kind of her uh, first time in charge of an organization where she's going to have more direct control that isn't part of a multi-person a panel, uh, or is it, you know, something where you're in a, a larger organization like uh, the Civil Rights Division at DOJ, where there's lots of other attorneys who are uh, focused on similar types of issues and similar types of policies. Here, uh, she's going to be kind of leading uh, at OCGP, and she's got a strong background uh, in understanding uh, to do that, but this might present somewhat of a, a little bit of a conflict with um, Marty Walsh's perspective on pay equity, where 
Jenny Yang has really come at things from more of an enforcement perspective, given her her um, background. She's been very uh, interested on um, pay equity issues, and her public and private statements so far have indicated that continued focus on um, uh, pay equity. And there's two new uh, executive orders that President Biden put in place that don't they they touch on pay equity, but they're broader race and gender equity across government um, uh, executive orders, and they set up working groups that uh, Jenny Yang will be on and others that we'll talk about are on. And you'll probably see uh, an approach similar to what we saw with President Obama's uh, pay equity task force, where they came up with a list of proposals, and then the agencies went about implementing those uh, proposals. Uh, Jenny Yang's also been interested uh, and and concerned about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches in the uh, hiring process, uh, and that definitely is something that you know, unlike EOC, where it's a charge-driven approach, OFCCP has advantages, and and Jenny Yang's already spoken about this publicly. Then the advantages are that they can be more proactive; they can target particular industries. And they get at access to data during an audit, which are kind of a little bit new opportunities uh, for uh, Jenny in terms of leading an organization that has that kind of sweeping authority. And then she's brought in uh, a, a chief of staff that is quite substantive, uh, very um, uh, accomplished uh, lawyer who uh, has significant experience in civil rights um, law and was the director of the Economic Justice Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under a law which, uh, if you don't know, is one of the leading civil rights um, organizations in the in the country. Um, and they bring a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, employment litigation and kind of um, structural change litigation. Uh, uh, Darley, uh was um, uh, uh, attended a or was a speaker at uh, 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 McGuire Woods um, webcast that we hosted on uh, African American leaders in the law. We we had a series of, of webcasts, and there was one in August where uh, Darley, uh spoke and had some very thoughtful, uh, interesting comments on. Uh, you know how to uh, make progress in uh, the the areas of uh, racial justice, and uh, that's on our website if you want to go to it and uh, check out her uh, her commentary. Uh, but but the point is that you know they're moving quickly. They're appointing people who have background. Now this you know it, it's not a background that is coming from an employment uh, employer's perspective. Um, so we would expect a, a much uh, uh, or somewhat more aggressive enforcement uh, posture. Uh, Tim Frederick is the, has been appointed the deputy assistant secretary uh, at uh, at OSHA. Comes from a union background um, uh, with uh, lots of experience on uh, safety and uh, health issues, uh, and so. You would you would expect uh, that, uh, and Brian will talk in a moment about some of the OSHA policy uh, developments. We expect OSHA to be very active in the in the coming uh, years. Uh, there's a deputy political deputy solicitor of labor who uh, again has lots of litigation experience, including as, as serving as a senior trial attorney uh, at the office of solicitor. Um, and uh, so the, in, another example of somebody who's got lots of experience in the uh, substantive area um, and in, in uh, litigation, um, and who's coming in uh, fairly early in the in the um, process, uh, which indicates you know the concept that they are going to hit the ground um, ground running. We don't have a nominee for solicitor of labor. Uh, but we we expect that uh, that soon the the um, 
Elena Goldstein, the deputy solicitor, is the second in command. Uh, once the solicitor comes in, will be the second in command um, in and a uh, very top uh, political appointee that really will have a big role in uh, DOL policy making activities, including uh, uh, engagement on OCGP issues. So Sharon Block has labor and employment background experience, and now she's the acting um, administrator of OIRA, which is the body that governs regulatory policy at the Office of Management and Budget um, regarding um, information collection and review of regulations that involve uh, information collection um, and, and data analysis. So uh, this is an important role, and, and, they, and they have somebody now who is, um, you know, has a labor and employment um, background and is going to be able to move things along at OMB uh, and understand and work with uh, DOL uh, folks to uh, get things done. Um, uh, several other appointees, and you'll see uh, Seth Harris, who was the Deputy Secretary of Labor in the Obama administration, now is coming in um, on the White House policy side. I think that there's roles that are on the Domestic Policy Council, and then there's roles that are in the uh, Economic Council. I think Harris is actually in the Economic um, Council, and then Pranita Gupta, um, who's on uh, DPC, uh, working with Susan Rice as the head of the DPC Domestic Policy Council. So you've got somebody like Susan Rice, who's very uh, well versed in the government, has very senior connections in the government, obviously um, running DPC, which shows uh, the seriousness which uh, Biden administration puts into that um, that role. And then you've got people like the former Deputy Secretary of Labor, who's going to be very influential on labor policy issues at the White House. Uh, there's a the, uh, kind of a trend where you're seeing people coming from the Obama administration um, uh, into the Biden administration. Uh, one of the slides we don't have here is Patricia Smith, who is the former solicitor of labor, is the senior counselor to uh, the secretary uh, of labor. So, uh, again, another very seasoned DOL uh, alum who is in a high-level policymaking um, role. Uh, Edward, I think you were going to talk about uh, Donald Sherman. Yeah, so just to kind of add to some of the appointees, I mean, I, I've known Donald for some time. Uh, he actually <laughs> gave me my first opportunity on the Hill. So, um, you know, I think he would be great in this role, um, you know, very fair-minded, even-killed person, uh, you know, also very data-driven. So I think the more information he has, the the, the better. Um, but, you know, I think we'll see some interesting work product, um, good work product um, out of Donald. I think, uh, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll serve well in the role. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see some of the policies that he'll be advocating for uh, in this administration. So um, – I'll leave it there and kind of turn it over. I think uh, Brian is, is is coming up next here with some of the other appointees. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, actually, I think, I think Bill was going to wrap up. Bill, you want to I think Bill, up? my apologies. <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, there's this uh, kind of flap that you've seen in the, in the, in the press about how uh, Biden, President Biden has asked the um, – General Counsel of the EOC and, and of the uh, NLRB uh, to resign, and then they've refused, uh, and they, they they said, well, you you don't have authority to uh, terminate us because we have specific appointments and we're in independent agencies, and that's um, uh, a class, legal question mark uh, related to you know the president's power. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things where uh, arguments have been made about the re restriction of the president's ability to uh, administer the executive authority of the United States under the Constitution. Um, but in any event, uh, 
uh, when they refused, President Biden terminated them and then appointed uh, acting, uh, you know, so there's an acting uh, general counsel uh, of EOC and uh, NLRB, and, now, and we also have a general counsel uh, nominee uh, that will uh, require Senate uh, uh, confirmation. Uh, so uh, that's to be seen how that plays out in the confirmation process. I'm sure there'll be somewhat of a dust up, but again, there is no legislative filibuster. Um, so any nominee likely will be uh, uh, confirmed unless there's some kind of uh, negative track record that, that uh, could be found uh, like uh, uh, the OMB uh, appointee uh, near a tandem uh, uh, nomination has been withdrawn because of problems getting through uh, the the Senate. So, uh, but but uh, we'll see how this plays out. So, Brian, I think you're going to talk now about the policy aspects. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Uh, and just to remind everybody, uh, especially for those who may have joined late, there is a Q and A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions about some of the folks we've talked about already, uh, uh, politically or otherwise, or the section we're about to cover now, feel free to go ahead and add that. If we have time at the end, we'll try and get to it. If we don't, we'll follow up with you individually, but feel free to ask any questions. I know this is hard since we're not live um, uh, in the sense of in a room together, but we're certainly glad to, to try and get to what we can. Um, as for uh, enforcement, uh, actions and sort of regulatory issues that are on deck. You know, separate from the new appointees, certainly the Biden administration has been very busy on a number of regulatory fronts over the last two months. Frankly, some of the actions are new initiatives. Uh, there are a handful of new things that we'll talk about. Some actions actually are carryovers from the Trump administration, surprisingly. Uh, uh, but most actions, as Edward alluded to earlier, uh, simply involve undoing, or at least beginning to undo, uh, past Trump administration regulatory efforts. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting, you know, I actually put this question to Chris Liu uh, about a month ago. Chris Liu is actually the DOL transition team lead uh, for the new administration and is working to sort of uh, not only sort of get personnel in place, but also to get sort of key regulatory actions up and moving quickly. Uh, he comes with a lot of experience, uh, like a lot of the players in the administration. But I asked him back on the 24th of February, so what do you believe will be Department of Labor's top three priorities uh, if you had to wave a magic wand? And he said, well, you know, number one, clear enforcement standards for COVID-19 health and safety. Uh, number two, uh, addressing the federal minimum wage. And number three, retraining workers for jobs in the 21st century, which really, in his perspective, means uh, having an increased emphasis on apprenticeships and community college education. Uh, uh, number one has already been started, which we'll talk about. Uh, number two, they've tried uh, and failed, uh, but they'll probably try again, which we'll also talk about. And number three, uh, they really haven't gotten that underway, but actually number three is interestingly a carryover from the Trump administration and the Bush administration. There's been a lot of chatter really, over the last 10 years about the need for increased apprenticeships uh, and more focused uh, uh, job retraining efforts across the spectrum. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, as an aside, you know, the, the DOL has a lot of hand in that. I mean, they have all sorts of rules under the FLSA and otherwise that, frankly, make apprenticeships and the extent to which they're paid and unpaid and how they're paid difficult to the extent that the Biden administration can loosen that up a little bit uh, through rulemaking to sort of help with that, that would be a positive thing. Uh, but it's interesting, number three has had a lot of chatter for a while, but no action. Uh, number one and two, um, there's already some action. Uh, and in particular, on, on, on OSHA, um, right out of the bat, uh, on January the 21st, uh, President Biden issued an executive order uh, it said a couple of different things. It said, look, at number one, I want within two weeks to have some revised guidance to employers on workplace safety during COVID. Uh, I also want the administration under OSHA to consider uh, whether an emergency temporary standard beyond guidance is necessary, and if, and if so, to implement that by March the 15th. 
and then he asks OSHA to review uh, uh, whether any short-term, medium, or long-term changes need to be made on the enforcement of uh, standards themselves, specifically related to COVID. Uh, I will tell you the emergency guidance was, in fact, issued within two weeks. That came out on January the 29th. Uh, and it was published with uh, some fanfare. Uh, there was an enforcement directive that just came out last week um, as well, sort of trying to better hone in on more virus-related enforcement efforts. I think the administration pointed out, I think correctly, that OSHA has not done a lot on COVID. If you actually look at the numbers from March 2020 to February 2021 of all uh, the virus-related uh, uh, inspections that existed during that time period, it only really amounted to 10% of all OSHA inspections during the past year, which is sort of hard to believe if you think about all the changes we've been through. Uh, and only 370 employers out of all those inspections got cited for any kind of virus-related violation. Why is that? Well, there's not a lot of guidance on what's a violation. You know, if you think about it, and Bill and Edward and I were talking about this before, one of the reasons that people say we might be helpful to have some emergency temporary standards is right now there are no standards. There is the general duties clause under OSHA, uh, which remains in effect. Uh, but if you had to point to what the standard is, a lot of the standards are set through CDC guidance. And you know, as you know, that guidance has shifted a lot. That guidance can in many places be conflicting uh, and vague. And it's hard to sort of cite people for, quote, violations of safety uh, under OSHA if you don't have clear directives about what the mandate is or is not for your industry. Interestingly enough, that March the 15th deadline came and went. Uh, emergency temporary standards are now at, are not out. They did not come out on the 15th. They did not come out yesterday. They are still not out today. Uh, hopefully, we'll expect to hear something from OSHA on this. But, you know, it's going to be a challenge, as Bill and I and Edward were talking earlier, there's a little bit of a conflict between messaging. On one hand, I think the administration certainly wants people to get vaccinated as fast as possible, and they don't want to do anything to discourage that. On the other hand, there's a little bit of conflict, frankly, in the science about what happens when you're vaccinated and whether you can stop wearing masks, and if so, when and with whom. And I think that's partly what the rub is with part of these standards and perhaps what the delay is, but we'll have to see. But on this promise, uh, they've moved and they've moved quickly, and this definitely was a campaign promise uh, of the president. On the federal minimum wage increase, um, as most folks know, the current federal minimum wage is $7.29 and hasn't gone up since 2009. There is a separate minimum wage for federal contractors, uh, which currently is at $10.95. That is actually set annually by the DOL, uh, and so that goes up uh, with some frequency. Uh, the, the Democrats certainly, as Edward appointed to, attempted to in, include uh, an increase to the federal minimum wage as part of the American Rescue Plan COVID relief bill that just passed. Uh, it was going to basically increase it to $9.50 immediately and step it up annually by a buck fifty, all the way up to $15 an hour by 2025. Um, but that was struck down in part because the budget reconciliation process that sort of resulted in that legislation really isn't designed to address this type of matter. It was actually struck down as part uh, of that bill based on a parliamentarian ruling, no less. Uh, and so uh, that was stripped from the bill and did not pass, but it's still swirling. You know, there's a, the Higher Wages for Americans Workers Act that's out there. Uh, there's the Wage the Raise the Wage Act of 2021 that's also there. They come at it with a little bit different approaches. One increases up to 15, one increases up to 10, one has it indexed over time uh, to the rate of inflation, one has it indexed over time to median hourly wage growth. I think the whole idea of indexing, I think Congress is coming around to, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, because it is so hard to get consensus on wage increases. And I think there is some general acknowledgement that wages have been stag stagnant for quite some time, but how fast to jump it up? And how often to jump it, uh, that's just a touchy political football. And that's why the whole idea of indexing growth, sort of like the annual increases for federal contractors, is starting to get some traction. Whether it has enough traction to actually pass anything uh, in a heavily divided Congress, who knows? 
um, but it's probably not going away, at least uh, for the time being. Uh, other things that went away immediately, well, we talked about this in back in December, there was a diversity and inclusion training executive order for, that applied to federal contractors that was highly controversial at the end of the Trump administration is Executive Order 13950 on combating race and sex stereotyping, which actually prohibited certain types of diversity and sensitivity training by federal subcontractors and contractors if it was deemed to be, quote, divisive or race or sex stereotyping or sex scapegoating. And there's a long definition about what that meant uh, that sent everybody into conniptions, appropriately so. That was revoked. Uh, right out of the box on Inauguration Day on January the 20th. And so it no longer is in effect and wasn't in effect, frankly, for very long. Um, other things that are actually on the chopping block, the independent contractor status rules. If you, if you remember, um, back in 2020 and 2021, the DOL went through the formal rulemaking process to try and sharpen uh, the independent contractor test, at least at the federal level, uh, to, to, to bring it more in line with, uh, I think, what some folks would say, at least from the management, labor, and employment side of the house, to what is a more um, balanced test. And the test that they were using was something called the economic realities test that was really primarily focused on who controls the work. Uh, and frankly, the worker's opportunity for profit and loss. But really, who is driving the work? Is it more like somebody who cuts your lawn, or is it more like somebody who sits in your office that you direct and supervise every day? Uh, uh, they went through the formal rulemaking process. The rule was actually uh, formalized and issued on January the 6th, right at the end of the Trump administration. Um, but right out of the box, uh, the Biden administration sort of withdrew a couple of opinion letters uh, related to this economic realities test, uh, they issued in February a delay of the rule uh, by a couple of months, which they're allowed to do up to May the 7th. Uh, and then they, right out of the box, back last week, issued their first notice of pro proposed rulemaking, indicating they want to withdraw the final rule and remake it. If we had to guess, they want to remake it probably to more align to what's called the ABC test that's out in California. Uh, which is definitely more pro-employee and, in some people's minds, more aligned to the gig economy. Where that ultimately ends, uh, who knows? But, you know, if this is different than an executive order, keep in mind, executive orders come and go in many respects with the stroke of a pen. There are some legal limits to it, but not the same regulatory rulemaking process that you have to go through for actual regulations. Here, since there is a regulation in effect, they actually have to go through and are going through this proposed rule baking uh, to take it off the books. And so uh, they're getting that going, but it's not going to go away immediately. It will take some time. Um, other things they want to make uh, go away quickly is the joint employer status. Uh, and we talked about this as well back in December, and sure enough, it happened. You know, if you think about it, the DOL issued a final rule back in March. NRLRB also issued their own rule. EEOC issued their own proposed rule, talked about their intent to issue a proposed rule. You know, it's, it's frankly confusing to a lot of folks and to a lot of employers that every agency has a little bit different definition of what a joint employer is, in part because the definition of an employer, believe it or not, from each of these agencies differs slightly. And so you have slightly different rules that come out of each of them. Uh, there's no action yet at the NLRB or EEOC level, in part because, frankly, as Bill pointed out earlier, there's not enough of a quorum to make that happen. Uh, once the Republican quorum drops and Democrats take control, you'll probably see some action on that as well. But on the DOL side, they've already taken action, and they issued a notice of proposed rulemaking last week about withdrawal of that rule. So that's definitely in their crosshairs. Uh, other things that's in the crosshairs, this may not apply to a lot of folks on the call, but Title IX, uh, you may have heard a lot about in the news. This is the rule uh, that applies to certain educational institutions that receive federal financial assistance from the Department of Education. Uh, back in 2011, under the Obama administration, there was a highly controversial uh, guidance letter. It's often referred to as a dear colleague letter that came down with all sorts of pronunciations that really changed the scope of Title VII in many ways. I think a lot of 
educational institutions were pretty hot about it at the time because it was enforcement guidance but wasn't regulation uh, and didn't really go through a true regulatory process to actually change the rules under Title IX. Uh, and there was a lot of concern about, you know, exactly what the Dear Colleague letter meant from a practical enforcement standard. The, the Trump administration, to their credit, went through a formal rulemaking process uh, and actually adopted new final regulations. Uh, back in 2020, it updated the definition of sexual harassment. Uh, it had very detailed complaint guidelines. It included a due process procedure that was very uh, descriptive uh, and specific standards of evidence, things that uh, had been debated really since 2011. Uh, those rules came effective in the end of August. Uh, a lot of schools spent a lot of time and money gearing up for that. Uh, and yet, uh, here we are back on the chopping block again on January the 25th. Uh, uh, President Biden signed an executive order uh, immediately expanding the definition of sexual harassment and sex discrimination under Title IX, which was expected. Uh, but he also, on March the 11th, issued an executive order basically directing the new Secretary of Education to propose policy changes on Title IX within the next 100 days. So they haven't started the formal rulemaking process yet again on Title IX, but it's coming just like we see uh, for independent contractors, just like we see for uh, joint employer status. Uh, this rule is going to be sort of up and on the block itself, and we're probably going to see a lot of changes, especially around due process. And I know that's going to be very frustrating for schools because they spent a lot of time and money putting in new procedures only to have that changed or likely to change. So we'll see what happens. Um, Speaking of other changes, um, and we'll talk about this some more in just a second, um, but for federal contractors who are on this call, certainly the biggest change that's still afoot is the AAP Affirmative Action Plan certification requirement. For folks who uh, keep up with this, this is a rule actually that started uh, in discussion format uh, under the Obama administration. It's been bandied back, back and forth. It was picked up by Craig Lean with OFCCP under the Trump administration, who pushed it forward. And OFCCP is basically asserting that for the first time they have authority to mandate whether federal contractors can certify uh, that they've actually completed their AAPs. And they're assert asserting that they can do this requirement without rulemaking, meaning that they can actually do it by sort of OFCCP fiat. Uh, they had public comment on that, uh, which our firm, among others, commented. Uh, interestingly enough, they didn't respond to a lot of comments. Uh, they indicated that AAP certification will be annual, not every two years, but they said there's basically not going to be any audit relief for large contractors to certify compliance. And frankly, there's a lot of vague terms that Bill, myself, and others raised questions about that they just simply did not address. That comment period ended in November and it's simply waiting OMB action. Uh, the only thing that's changed is uh, literally last week, OFCCP created a brand new website landing page. Uh, and I've given you the text here. It says, coming soon. It seems, seems like a advertisement for a new hamburger chain, but coming soon, affirmative action plan, verification interface, AAVI. Uh, and they say it's gonna be a new secure web-based interface created to improve communication and the transfer of affirmative action plan data. Um, you know, Bill and I were talking about this earlier. When you look at the OMB information, it sounds like they're talking about certification, but not filing, not annual filing of AAPs, but just simply a certification, sort of raising your hand and saying, I hereby swear that I've completed my AAP, but you don't file it. And yet, this talks about the affirmative action plan, quote, verification interface. And, you know, on one hand, you know, maybe it's simply an interface to submit data in the course of an OFCCP audit via sec secure file transfer, and that's all this is. But if that's the case, why is it called a verification interface? It's sort of confusing. And so uh, a lot of us are scratching our head about this, and we'll just have to see uh, what happens. Uh, one other thought before we uh, wind up with a couple other closing considerations. Uh, don't forget about unions. Uh, certainly, uh, we talked about this back in December, that there's a lot of pressure uh, to restore elements of the old ambush election rules that were around in 2015. 
Uh, there are a lot of folks uh, in the Democratic Party who aren't very happy about some NLRB decisions uh, that happened back in 2019 and 20 uh, regarding how uh, unionization efforts happen and, and what can happen with communications and what access you have to data of an employer side to communicate to employees. Uh, there's going to be a move to, to sort of uh, undo all that, and there already is one, uh, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act or the PRO Act, which actually passed the House. That's probably dead on arrival in the Senate, uh, if I had to guess, um, especially given insufficient votes to overcome filibuster. Uh, but as and, you know, Edward alluded to earlier, there's some chatter about whether uh, that is going to end. Uh, and to the extent that does happen, you know, maybe this will get more traction. But at the moment, uh, we believe the PRO Act, for pro or con, um, is dead in the water. So, uh, with that, I know we're at, almost out of time. We have a couple of closing thoughts. Uh, and again, uh, submit your Q&As if you have them. If we can get to them at the end, we'll try. But Edward, do you want to uh, take the next slide talking about sort of a common question we have about the EEOC? Sure, sure. Thanks, uh, Brian. So, here our question is, are we uh, at an increased risk of EEOC ch uh, charges or bad charge outcomes over the next four years. Um, and so in, in talking with Brian and, and doing a bit of uh, uh, research here, it, uh, well, first we'll, we'll go back to the EEOC charge history. So um, you could see that across the board, it's been uh, relatively, uh, uh, you know, similar in, in each fiscal year as far as the, uh, number of EEOC charges. I think this gives you um, this gives you sort of an indication as to um, you know how the charges actually are going down. And so um, I think over the next four years we can we can likely see that some of the charges will go down. Um, and I think we talked a little bit earlier about some of the issues the EEOC will have to face this year, mainly along the lines of uh, pay equity data. Um, some of the EEOC charge outcomes, um, and I think, you know, it's been a, a relatively mixed between race, gender, disability, um, but more within a news cycle than political, than, than other political administrations. But uh, as far as the, the, the enforcement priorities, um, they're going to depend on on a change in the in the commission. So you know we'll keep our eyes open there, but um, we will see uh, a number of things that um, will be controversial. Um, Republicans will support, Democrats will oppose, and vice versa. So I think some of the things that uh, we will likely see moving forward is, of course, eliminating barriers and recruitment and hiring. Uh, protecting vulnerable workers, including immigrant and migrant workers in underserved communities from discrimination, uh, addressing selected emerging and developing issues, ensuring equal pay protections for all workers, uh, preserving access to the legal system and preventing systematic harassment. And so um, these, are all, these are all things that we are likely to see um, in, in 2021 and beyond. And I think on uh, the EEOC front, the, a question mark is whether or not we're going to start to see more uh, commissioner charges where it only requires one commissioner to initiate a commissioner's charge and then an investigation. There could be a substantial systemic investigation by uh, the EEOC. And when we're talking about uh, OFCGP, we expect that there could be a return to more industry-focused focused uh, audit uh, approaches uh, in the Obama administration. Uh, it, the the OCGP was focused on both the technology sector and financial services and really hit those sectors really hard with large numbers of audits. Uh, they were doing these things called enterprise audits where they would bulk up the number of audits for a particular employer. So like half the employer's affirmative action programs would be audited in one cycle. Hopefully those types of approaches uh, do not return. I'm not sure that they were particularly productive and they create a lot of um, chaos and problems for the particular 
uh, employer, and there really isn't a very good uh, basis, um, in fact, for how they're selecting a particular industry to focus on, um, you know, as to why that industry needs to have all this um, extra um, scrutiny and, and face huge burdens in in the process. Um, we do expect that there will be significant changes in terms of perhaps what we call the bedside manner of OCCP during a typical audit where they might be more aggressive on timetables and audit requests. Uh, but there, are, there is some built-in, at the end of the Trump administration, OCCP adopted a final uh, rule which locks in a certain uh, transparency requirements around predetermination notices and notice of violation, which should help um, ensure that employers are not uh, subject to uh, kind of hide the ball tactics. Um, but we'll, we'll see how that uh, how that plays out. Brian, turn it over to you. Yeah, the, one of the other common questions we get is. Uh, so, you know, we talked about the AAP certification. There's been a lot of chatter about it. What's all the fuss? You know, we already do our plans. What's the big deal about certification? And just to remind people, it is a big deal. You know, it, it, it on one hand, it affords the Department of Labor and the Biden administration their first big opportunity to make a big regulatory change deemed as pro-enforcement uh, in a way that hasn't happened in OFCCP in a long time. I mean, if you think about it, you've, we've never had to do this kind of annual certification before. Interestingly enough, AAP vendors love this. Uh, what a shock, right? Because for for individuals who are slow to act on getting their affirmative action plans together, uh, or who aren't necessarily as disciplined about it, um, you know, this is a boon to their business. And they actually advocated for this, frankly, against their own clients' interests. We did not. Uh, we uh, expressly sort of opposed uh, the rules for a number of, of different reasons, which I'll talk about a minute ago, in a minute. But just to, to give you a, a, a preview, it is definitely coming. You know, this is something that has been talked about for a while. It continued under the Trump administration with Director Lean. It's simply waiting OMB approval. Do not expect it to not move forward. It will happen. It's just a matter of when it's going to drop, the full scope of the certification that's involved, and frankly, the effect of any potential litigation that's going to stay any action uh, and whether that occurs. And so we'll we'll have another webinar exclusively on this topic uh, later on. But the, the big deal, frankly, is uh, in the weeds. I mean, the, the questions we asked in the comments are, so exactly what are we certifying? Are we certifying that we've simply done the math, that we've done our narrative, we run the reports, and we have it on the shelf? Or are we certifying all of the 40-some other executive order obligations with respect to affirmative action posting and outreach and record keeping and notice and you name it? Is that what we're certifying, that we're compliant on 100% of every last one of those items across our platform? Um, that's a big item. Uh, who knows, right? Likewise, if we do that certification and we happen to be incorrect about something, or someone overstates their certification stance, does that open you up to false claim act risks, both for criminal and civil liabilities? And likewise, if you're a public, uh, a public company, are you now gonna have to indicate this as part of your other certifications regarding compliance? And is that gonna open you up to lawsuits as well? Uh, it's interesting, I mean, who knows? It has a lot of different challenges. We're also very concerned about who's gonna have access to this data, is it gonna be subject to FOIA? and other sort of scrutiny, and, and more importantly, what is OSCP going to do with it once they get it? I suspect you'll see a change coming about how they select individuals for audit after they get this. They haven't said that, um, but I wouldn't be shocked. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see whether uh, the mechanism for audit review itself will change or change substantially uh, once they start to get this data um, uh, in their grasp, if it's just a certification, it, in theory, it shouldn't be that big a deal. Uh, you know, the, the, how they use that certification data for selection should be fairly limited. If it's an actual affirmative action filing of some type, well, that's a different matter. Uh, so we'll just have to see. But Bill, any closing thoughts on that before we end? 
No, the only closing thought would be just that we're, you know, we'll keep an eye on this and offer uh, updates uh, through webcasts like this, uh, including ones that are more, you know, in depth on a particular development. For example, when that certification comes out, we'll pro we'll do a focused webcast on that that goes into details. So um, just just to let everybody know that we're watching it. Yeah, but speaking of watching, uh, thank you for joining in. Uh, we know we're out of time. We want to be respectful of that. We have received a couple of questions um, uh, through the chat. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to those, but we'll reach out to you individually after this uh, about that. Likewise, I always think of my best questions after these webinars like this are over. If you have questions for Edward or Bill or myself uh, that you think about later or when you're going through the deck uh, you want to ask us about, shoot us an email, give us a call. Uh, we're certainly happy to help, uh, and we appreciate you joining. Thanks again, everybody. Bill, Edward, thank you. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Thanks.